This little place, which used to be a garage, is one of the many workshops now working full-time on war production. However small a workshop may be, there is some vital job which it can be equipped to do. The boy at this lathe used to repair bicycles. Now he's helping to make adjusting plugs for the shock absorbers of Valentine Tank. This adjusting plug passes through three separate factories before it reaches the main assembly line. And it's a good example of the way the contribution of many factories dovetails to produce the finished tank. The plugs come to us in the rough, just as they left the foundry. First of all, they're machine and a lathe. This does three separate operations. Chamfering. Recessing and facing inside of flange. And forming the outside diameter. Before the plugs go to the next machine, the work is checked with the snap gauge. The next job is threading the surface that has just been formed on the lathe. We're only making a few small tank parts here, but they've got to fit other parts made in other shops. So once again the work is inspected, and this time by a thread gauge in the inspection shop. Well, that's completed the machining of the adjusting plug, and that's the last we see of it. In our factory before the war, we were making shock absorbers for tanks as part of our production, but no, we're doing nothing else. The cylinder reaches us as rough tubing, and it goes through several processes in our machine shop. The first of these is broaching the bore. Circular cutters are pulled through the centre of the tube to size and finish the bore. It takes a load of 30 tonnes, that's about equal to the weight of two complete valentines, to pull this broach through the tube. Then the outside is turned on a lathe to clean up the rough surface and reduce the cylinder to something near the right diameter. The grinding machine next door brings the cylinder down to the exact size and puts a final finish on it. The thread is now cut on one end of the cylinder. A circular nut will be fitted here at a later stage. Besides the operations we have seen, the cylinder is given a hard metal deposit to withstand wear and an anti-rust protective plating to withstand weather. You see, these cylinders have got to be as tough as we can make them. Before the cylinder goes to the assembly shop, it has to pass a strict inspection. Only a tolerance of one thou on the diameters is allowed. In the assembly shop, the final shock absorber unit is built up from the 60 odd components. Here is the adjusting plug which we got from the small workshop. The filler tube is being screwed into it. Now oil is pumped through it to test the valve already in the tube. The plug is then screwed into the cylinder end cap and the sub-assembly is complete. It forms a cap for retaining the fluid in the main cylinder. This unit works on the hydraulic principle.
At other benches, more sub-assemblies are going on. Here's the piston rod assembly. The 20 odd parts are made separately, but they've all got to fit at this stage. Then the piston is put into the cylinder. Next, the fluid is poured in. When the valves are correctly adjusted, the cap with the original adjusting plug is screwed on the end of the shock absorber, and our job here is finished. This is where the final assembly is done. We get the shock absorbers, along with many other components, and turn out valentines. But first of all, the shock absorber has to be built into the suspension unit. Here are some of the different parts of the suspension unit. Springs, bell housings, stub axles, all now brought together for their final assembly. The shock absorber is placed in the centre of the spring. This is then compressed and a nut fitted. This gives us our initial load. Between them, the shock absorber and the spring take the strain of any bumps. That's another part of the job completed. Now the two forks which will hold the wheel axles are assembled with the shock absorber unit. One end of the spring is housed on the primary fork which carries a large wheel, and the other end is attached to the secondary fork, which will carry two smaller wheels. In an adjoining shop, the bracket is being riveted. The bracket is fitted to the suspension unit, and the whole assembly is then ready for fitting to the hull of the tank. It comes to the main assembly line. The hull of the tank, two armour-plated sides and flooring has already been built. Now the four separate suspension units, each to carry three wheels, are fitted. At the same time, other jobs are going on. Here come the rear louvers, bulletproof coverings to protect the engine and transmission. The louver is full of baffles and angles to allow air into the engine but to keep bits of bullets out. Now the wheels are added and the suspension unit is complete. Work goes on inside and outside. A dozen jobs are done at once. Each new part that is added is itself an assembly of many other parts. Now the tank is rolled forward onto its tracks, its own permanent way. The gun turret is lowered into its housing. It is power driven to give the gunner all round and accurate fire. But the gunner can't do his job properly unless the suspension unit is doing its job, keeping the gun platform steady when the tank is moving. Finally, oil is pumped in.
And now the time has come for the test driver to take over. Under its own power, the Valentine moves out of the factory for its trial. The final item has been added to our valentine, the guns. It's off for delivery now. On whatever front it first sees battle, it's got the right stuff and the right workmanship in it to stand up to the job it's got to do and to give a little better than it gets. In 1918, reviving the use of armor for the fighting man, tanks surge on to final victory. In 1938, 20 years roll by and the pendulum swings out to the extreme. Unable on all but the firmest ground to keep from bogging, France, along with others, produces 75 tons of massive, unwieldy armor, incapable of maneuver and the high-speed tactics of a modern war. Last time, yes, such weight might have crushed, such size might have awed and stupefied. But the call today is for mobility and speed. And so has come about the vital need for instant and confident recognition of AFVs as they roam far and wide. Indeed, no one device has brought more weight to bear on the whole strategy of war than the modern tank. New tactics have been devised to overcome defence, and when the present conflict was but nine months old, with a new and devastating use of tanks, the Battle of France was lost and won. Formidable, yes, but vulnerable. To meet attack with attack, to match hitting power with hitting power, to wreak havoc in the midst of these battleships of the land, instant recognition, followed by determined and calculated attack, is the one to reap a just reward so that the enemy may be singled out with a sureness of mind, leaving science and guts to take their inevitable toll. prostrate before the onslaught of anti-tank, how is it that this can come to pass? By a sure and steady application to the job of distinguishing friend from foe on sight. And not least in importance comes the first phase in this vital training, the recognition of the Allied and British AFV. Before we can tackle any individual AFV and its recognition as such, we must learn how to look at one, the names of the various parts, and get to know how those parts may vary to give you the clues to recognition. Right ho then, let's present for your attention an AFV with no pretense to nationality or creed, in fact a ghostly form into which we can peer and piece together the wakes. Out of armoured fighting vehicle, let's take the word vehicle first. Now, a vehicle has to have a chassis, which amounts to a platform, really, 
with four wheels to, as it were, keep it off the ground. In control is the driver, who sits well forward so that he can see what's coming to him. Next, we'll give the driver an engine, which in British AFVs we usually put at the back end of the platform to give him a good forward seat and keep the nasty smells away. Being in a considerate frame of mind, we now cover the driver and engine with armour plating, the hull. This prevents them being shot at and put out of action and is in fact the body of an AFV. On this we put louvers to let the air in and so that the driver can continue to see, we give him vision slits to look through and perhaps a periscope as well. The whole compartment occupied by the driver, which may protrude above the hull, is known as the driving compartment or driving cab. Now there's another chap to cater for, the commander, the fellow who actually knows more about everything. He stands up in the middle of the hull to command and spy out the land ahead. As likely as not, he'll want a weapon to attack or defend himself with, but as he happens to be a busy man, what with wireless and tactics and all that sort of thing, we'll give him a gunner and give the gunner the gun. Now, we don't want them shot at, not by the enemy at any rate, so we'll cover them with the turret. This can be traversed so that the weapons in it can be brought to bear in any direction. The whole compartment occupied by the commander and his gunner is called the fighting compartment or fighting cab. Next, so as to preserve the commander's and gunner's vision, come more periscopes with additional vision slits should the periscopes become damaged and put out of action. But the commander may want to get a private look-see all round. So we'll add the cupola with vision slits and sometimes a periscope as well. So much for the armoured car, used principally for reconnaissance and for reporting back to the heavier armoured units in the rear. line in roadwork, eh? But for cross-country work, we need a different kind of animal. Oi, any suggestions? Ah, we passed one, did we? Right, let's go back and take a look at another and heavier type of AFV, known as the tank. Though composed of the same principles of design, this is the fella to smash em and bash em. Cupola, perhaps? Turret? Gun? Or guns? And machine guns? Hull? Periscopes? and vision slits. Louvers still appear in the hull to act as air intakes and of course they're more pronounced on the tank. Now for the purposes of illustration let's retain the armoured car chassis and see how we get on. Well that's no good obviously. This fellow's too heavy an animal for cross-country work without sinking in. So remember the old gag and get out of the rut with the aid of a platform consisting of old branches, rubble, or anything else to hand, which will give it something to run on. But how much better to have a special platform or track along which it can run all the time? Now, if we thread the used track over the wheels and attach it to the unused part, as the tank moves forward, it'll carry its own platform and lay it down as it goes. Now let's get rid of the tyres and fill out with more wheels bogey wheels to distribute the weight. But the driving wheel's having rather a rough time, so let's give it teeth to fit into the track and prevent friction. Okay. Blimey, that's no good either. If the obstacle is higher than the centre of the wheel. Got any ideas? Ah, that's done the trick. An idler that's filled the track out and got her going again. And if you want a little quiet fun backing up steps, out goes the track and up goes the driving wheel, this time to become the driving sprocket, and an ordinary bogey takes its place. Now, of course, it's not necessary to have such big bogies and waste metal, so let's get down weight and reduce them in size. Now, how do we go? <laughs> yes, something's got to be done about that slack in the track. Hence the jockey wheels to keep it in place. If you don't see jockey wheels, rails may be in use to guide the track, but they don't show, so why bring that up? With jockey wheels or rails in place, bogey wheels can be reduced in size and increased in numbers, distributing the weight of the tank over a greater surface. Oh dear, what about the Alps, eh? 
That's liable to gum up the works a bit. So with surprising ingenuity, we supply our tank with springs to cope with the job and ride in splendid luxury while they do the dirty work. Springs and wheels are often lumped together and called the suspension. Well, there you are then. That ties up the names and reasons for the average AFV. Now to get down to the job of recognizing a tank. For this, let's take the two main angles in tank recognition and see what shows up and what varies from one type to another in head-on and in side view. Though, of course, don't forget the other angles. Points of variation and combinations of them will crop up at any angle at which she presents herself. So glue your eyes to those binoculars and make the most of them. No, oh, blast, this one's gone hull down on us. A view she may present very often, either in coming over a rise or for reasons of cover. All she shows you is a turret, so learn your turrets good and proper. The tank itself may be side view, or head on here, for all you know. The turret's head on at any rate, so let's have a look at it. A turret may be square, rounded, sloping, undercut, or a combination of all those. They may be tall or squat, and cupolas may appear. Squat, domed, tall, sometimes offset, sometimes central. Next, wireless mast. Is it on the turret or on the hull? In some cases, there are two of them. One point to remember, don't be foxed by the silhouette of a turret being broken by headlamps, smoke projectors, outside stowage, etc. Go for the general outline every time. Now let's creep closer and see how the turret may be placed in relation to the hull. Ah, head on, is she? Right, here we go. Usually central, occasionally offset. But again, make sure the armament is pointing to the front. Come on, never touch me. The turret may also taper to the extreme edge of the hull, in which case you'll find it difficult to tell where turret ends and hull begins. Another point, there may be auxiliary turrets or sponsons mounting additional armament. Now, how does the hull appear? Wider than the turret? Or the same size? Are its sides convex, sloping, or square? One more point now. Boxes and etc. may again break the outline of the hull, so take a good look and make sure. And now, most important, the driver's cab. Is there one long one for two? Two single ones? Does the driver sit on his own in splendid isolation? Or can't you see the darn thing at all? And lastly, the tracks. Are they in line with the hull sides, set closer in, or wider out? Are they above and uncovered? They can be, you know, even with modern tanks. What about the width of the tracks themselves? And the distance between them in relation to the general outline of the tank? And so there's the head-on view for you and variations which may crop up. What's going on? Oh, damn, she's hull down on us again. Traverse, right. Uh, left. No, come on, make up your mind. Now to the side view of the turret, and there's plenty to tie her up with. Starting at the top again, the cupola, if any, can vary as before in position, size, and shape. Turret armament now. See how it influences the outline of the front. balloon or a bag of nuts. <laughs> and as for that back line, you may find surprising differences there too. Influenced by the wireless mast or masts and that outside stowage again. Don't forget in this view that turrets may vary in height and width too. Now let's creep up on her once more. And blimey, side view all the time, it makes you think, eh? So to the position of the turret on the hull. Central, sometimes well forward, then again towards the rear. But this is usually only the case with light tanks. Looks as if she's toppling over backwards, doesn't it? And now for the hull itself. Long, short, shape at front, shape at the back. And again, how many turrets? Yes, you can have auxiliary turrets here too, placed forward of the main one or at the rear. Sponsons cut into the hull in front or set well forward of it and driving compartment, which may project or not, as the case may be. Outside stowage again. 
And don't let it fool you, even if there is an auxiliary petrol tank on its tail. It may be jettisoned. How does the top of the hull appear in relation to the top of the tracks? High above them? Just above them? Or do the tracks hide the hull? Bogey wheels are a very important recognition feature, should you be able to see them. Are they large, filling the space between the top and bottom of the track? Evenly spaced? Or unevenly spaced? And is there a driving sprocket, front or rear? And idler wheel, in either position? See how they affect the outline of the track. Are they both raised? Or, a rather unusual point, is the idler dropped to the ground at the rear? Back to the bogies, they may shrink in size, in which case our tank may have jockey wheels to carry the track. Small bogies may be independent, linked in pairs, or of unequal size. The suspension, upright, oblique, scissor, and a pair or more coupled by girders, which is not altogether unknown. And don't forget, in some cases, bogies may be partly screened from view by dust guards or mud guards, which are fitted under active service conditions or by skirts, sometimes with mud chutes, to get rid of the muck. Detail of turret, hull, suspension. So much for the recognition features which may vary to give a clue to a tank's identity. But don't forget you'll be lucky if you can see them all in detail. In the distance, you may only see the outline. Even with binoculars, she may well have her suspension covered by undergrowth. Or she may be hull down, which again might hide some well-known point of recognition. All of which brings us to rule number one, get to know your turrets. Turret recognition is a most important thing, but link up your turret recognition with detail of suspension and hull. Remember, no one single feature will ever give you the answer. It may have four unevenly spaced bogies, but that doesn't necessarily mean this. It might just as easily mean this. And so to rule number two, combination of detail in any of these, turret, suspension, Hull is a sure clue to the identity of a tank. So go for the detail at first, and in a little while you'll find you know the general look of the fellow, even though some of him may be concealed from view. <laughs> Keep on spotting AFVs, from models, from photographs, from drawings, from charts. Study national characteristics, then get to know the real thing. Keep your eyes open to observe all angles, all variations, all shapes and sizes. Keep at it until easy familiarity with every type is automatic. Until the object of recognition is achieved. Until snap judgment takes the place of hesitation and that split second is gained with which to attack, surprise, lure and smash the enemy before he can escape destruction. Spot that tank! Here we are in the second round of the big fight between Battling Bruiser and Shorty Smart. Shorty's taking a lot of punishment, but he's putting up a grand show. It's science versus brute force. That's the stuff, Shorty. Keep him guessing. He's putting up a marvelous show, this boy. He's got pluck. The big bruiser's got a tough job ahead of him if he's going to win this fight. Tanks are the big bruisers of this war, but they have their weak spots too. Don't forget it, a flea can tickle an elephant to death if he does it in the right place. When it comes to man against tank, you can plant a knockout just as the lightweight with skill and pluck can get the better of the big bruiser. This is one way of planting a knockout. Or the tank can be forced into a prepared ditch and stalled so that it can't move or go on fighting. Or you can catch the crew when they come up for air and finish them off to a penny. But it's not always so easy as all that. The bruiser packs a punch too. If he lands one, not all the skill in the world will save him. Look out for his punch. The tank's punch is his gun. You've got to get in first. It's your knockout against his guns. Avoid that punch. Get close and attack. 
Up against a tank, you've got to get in close with the right weapons. What are the right weapons? Here are some of them. The 73 grenade, the ST, the Hawkins, the AW bomb, the 68 grenade and EY rifle, and the anti-tank rifle. You can do a lot of damage with the anti-tank rifle at about 30 yards range. And these are good spots to go for. The tracks, between the track and the bogies, and the bogies themselves. The EY rifle with its discharger cup fires a 68 grenade, but of course take the pin out first. Go for the same weak spots with this one too. Here we have the Hawkins grenade. It explodes only when it's crushed under great pressure. In other words, under a tank. But if the grenade is planted between the tracks, the tank will pass over it unharmed. So remember, you've got to get it under the tracks. Here's another track buster, the 73 grenade. It's got an instantaneous fuse, so you've got to aim straight and hit the mark. Of course, if you can't get at the tracks, you can still do plenty of damage with it elsewhere. The junction of the turret and the hull, for example. But make sure there's no blister. Then there's the gun mantlet, another good spot to go for. The ST grenade is like a toffee apple when you remove the metal casing. It's got a five second fuse and it sticks to its target until it explodes. Land it on top of the tank. It'll stick there all right, but don't expect it to cling to a vertical surface because it just won't. This is the AW bomb. To all intents and purposes, it's an incendiary and the spot to go for is the top of the air louvers. They're the lungs of the tank. The air is drawn down through the louvers to feed the engine. A tank engine must have air, and you can readily understand how, if you land an AW bomb on the louvers, the whole works will go up in smoke. See how quickly it bursts into flame and spreads like the wildfire it is. And even if you miss the louvers, look at the dense cloud of smoke an AW gives off. If you land it on the front, the tank will be moving about in a fog of its own smoke screen. Moreover, the suffocating fumes will be drawn through the ventilators and smoke out the rats inside. So remember, you've got a most effective weapon, the AW bomb, if you go for the louvers, or smash it against the front of the tank. Know your weapons. Know your punches. Use the right one on the right spot. A blow in the wrong spot is a blow wasted. So go for his weak spots. That's where they do most harm. Go for his legs. They've got a lot of weight to carry. The legs of a tank are its tracks. They are vital to its movement, to its maneuverability. If anything happens to them, it can't budge an inch, so smash them. One way is to plant Hawkins grenades in the path of an oncoming tank. But near enough together, remember, to make sure of catching at least one of the tracks on the way over. Got it, fair and square on the track. Now see what happens. The tank runs off the broken track, and before the crew inside realizes what it's all in aid of, it's digging itself a nice hole in the ground. When a tank becomes immobilized, it's three quarters beaten. Now it's no more than a metal pillbox with a very limited supply of ammunition. And that's the end of that snake in the grass. But legs aren't the only weak spot. Go for his eyes. Close them up. Blind him. Then you've got him at your mercy. The eyes of a tank are its periscope and vision slits. The slits are backed by glass. Most German tanks carry only two spares. If you get a bullseye on the slit, the glass will splinter. So, when the last one's used up, the Hun will have to put his eyes right close to the metal. Go for his eyes. You can blind a tank this way too, with smoke bombs from a two-inch mortar. Use the smoke screen as cover to get in close and plant an ST grenade. Or lay your smoke screen to conceal a prepared or natural trap. Even the toughest fighter needs that break between rounds to regain his fighting strength. He must have the care and attention of his seconds. 
Without it, he could not go on. The seconds of a tank are its crew. Repairs and maintenance must be carried out at every available opportunity. Don't give them that opportunity. Keep them on the move. Give them no rest. The tank's got another weakness. The limited elevation and depression of its guns. Take advantage of this to avoid its punches. Get on top. Keep out of sight until it's too close to hit you. Then let him have it. Let him have it. With a knowledge of Ringcraft, brain can be drawn every time. Ringcraft means knowing all the moves of the game. It means knowing your way around. Get to know your way around. Get to know your maps so that you can easily recognize the features of the ground and your best chances for laying a tank ambush. Natural obstacles like quarries with their steep cliffs and wide deep pits and effective barriers like rivers should all be taken into account when planning your tactics. Thick woods, however, are not always impassable to tanks, but a wood of this kind is a difficult proposition and only likely to be used as a harbour during daylight. On flat, open ground, you'll be at a disadvantage because there's no natural cover. But there's a solution to most difficulties, in this case, slit trenches for LMG posts. But don't forget concealment. Camouflage your positions thoroughly. Make the most of materials on the spot. Improvise. Use your imagination. Use your imagination in training. If you can't get the real thing, a lorry makes a good substitute for a tank with a signal flag swung round to represent the gun turret. With your tank and swinging turret in position, you can develop stalking tactics, rapid movement in attack, and eliminate fatal indecisions. But a quick brain demands a healthy body. Keep fit. Skill and science alone are no good. It's the long months of training and preparation that give the boxer staying power in the ring. It's fitness that counts when you're up against a ruthless enemy. Your physical training has got to be hard and strenuous to make you tougher, keener, more alert, and more dangerous than your enemy. When you're right in the thick of it, it's your fitness that may decide whether you or the Bosch delivers... The knockout! So, remember... One, know your enemy. Two, know your weapons. Three, go for his weak spots. Four, go for his legs. Five, go for his eyes. Six, give him no rest. Seven, avoid his punches. Eight, know your ground. Nine, keep fit and knock him out! about the tank battles in Libya, but probably you have very little idea of how they are fought. The film you are about to see shows you the sort of thing that might happen in this country. The film will show how an armoured formation reconnoitres and locates the enemy, and how the information is passed back to the higher commanders. You will see how a plan is made, and how the orders are passed right down to the junior leaders and men who have to fight the battle. Come on, David, let's get down to it. You're in on this too, Jack. Now, the general idea is this. They're going to lose a bunch of Bosch tanks somewhere in our divisional area. Where exactly, we don't know. It's up to someone to spot them and report them back to division. These Bosch fellows are going to be allowed full scope to use their initiative. So what may happen, nobody knows. Division will counterattack with the troops best placed tactically. Which units will fall for the dirty work, we don't know. That depends entirely on the movement of the Bosch. Where do we concentrate, sir? We remain in our normal areas. That's the main point. They will do their damnedest to break through us, and we've got to hold them at all costs. Clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right, Saturday 16th. Zero hour, Saturday the 16th, and the British defending force has sent out a reconnaissance plane to scour the countryside for the first sign of enemy tanks. It's not known yet where they are, or in what direction they're going to move. There they are, British tanks with enemy markings, especially for the exercise, at their secret concentration point, ready to attack. Come on, orders. Intention. We'll enter the divisional area, just east of Littleport. Objective, 
The shunting yards is tax bay. If we can take that, we'll command the whole area. They'll expect us to go around the high ground, but that'll be purely a faint attack. At a given moment, I'll give an order of change of direction. We'll cut straight up the hill and descend down the slope to the objective. They won't be looking for that. And by the time they've rumbled us, we'll be in Saxby. Right, any questions? No. no. OK, Mark. Hello, Peter. Rev. One calling. A hundred tanks moving northeast, eight miles east of Littleport. Head at six two four two two zero. Rev. One, Peter. Over. I'll pass this on right away. Hello, G three. It's Gilbert here. Yes. A hundred tanks. Six two four two two zero. Oh. Goodbye. Air report, sir. 100 tanks moving northeast, 8 miles east of Littleport. Head at 624220. Right. There you are. As soon as the enemy force is reported, the general signals the whole division, and every man runs to his action station, ready in case it's his brigade that the general has decided is best placed tactically to plan and organize the counterattack. That looks like a job for the seventh. Okay. Right. Yes, there they are. And they're moving up there. They're almost certainly out for Saxby. But from which direction? It's up to the brigade to decide. Send that over. Right. You through to Argo? Yes, sir. Hello, Argo. Bolo calling. Air reports, 100 tanks moving northeast from Mambles, 624-220. At 1100 hours, engage at once. Bolo to Argo, over. OK, off. Professional message, sir. Air reports, 100 tanks moving north from Mambles, 1100 hours. Engage at once. That should put them just about down. That's right, sir. Now, the 110th are well placed for that. Let's have a laser off, sir. Yes, sir, 110th, sir. At 11 o'clock, 100 Bosch tanks reported there, moving north. Yes, sir. I want your battalion to move at once to there, prepared to attack them. They'll move along a line west of the high ground towards Saxby. You ought to cut them off in a flat just north of the ridge here. Right, sir. Clear? Yes, sir. Right. At this stage, because secrecy is essential to the defenders, the brigadier's plan of attack is taken personally by the liaison officer to the battalion commander, who is going to have the actual job of fighting the battle in the field. Message to brigade commander, sir, to say, take up a position on a line, Gill's Lap, Chatsbury, to count 100 enemy tanks advancing west. Right. The order of march will be you, Todd, then you, Ken, and then you, John. Now, is that quite clear? Have you got any questions? Yes, yes sir. Oh, oh, come on, let's get going. The tank battalion is dispersed in squadrons over a wide area, and scout cars race each squadron leader back to his own tanks. Driver, 
The scout cars have a more important part to play yet. And to anticipate any surprise move by the enemy, they are sent ahead of the main force to keep brigade headquarters informed. Tanks changing direction right. Okay, off. They're further south than I thought they'd be. I've got it. They're going up this carpet. We are here. If we're nippy, we can climb the bridge and catch them before they reach the top. The gradient's all right. We can just about do it. Hello, Argo. Argo calling. Change of plan. They little know what's in store for them. And up towards the top of the high ground go the British tanks, ready for the enemy.
on battle with neither side giving way. Hello, PT. Mine calling. Come in now. Right handed. Attack enemy from south. So, cruiser tanks. The Greyhounds of the Royal Armoured Corps are called in to attack the enemy on the flank and straight for that objective they go. Seen come the cruisers, getting their first view of the battle raging in the distance. This is something the enemy didn't expect. British cruisers approaching on the flanks, sir. What? Hello, dear. The ever retired. Tanks about. are getting a double shell. Cease fire. Cease fire! So home go the crews, with another day's training in how to cope with the surprises of a modern Panzer battle. For it's on their initiative and resource that the result will depend whenever and wherever they meet the enemy. Never mind about cheering us soldiers. If there are any cheers floating around, I'd rather you save them for somebody else. For instance, for the boys and girls of our tank factory who make our intercom gear. You all know what the intercom is, but what you may not know is how really important it is to us in action. You see, in the noise of battle, it's impossible for us to speak to each other, and so we have to use this contraption. Hello, Sergeant. Eh, we think you're wonderful. Well, you see what I mean, don't you? It's about the people who make the intercom. What about us turret welders? We ran up 12% last week. Well, we was over 14. Oh, you. What about the rivet boys? Don't get me wrong now. I know you're all aces here. I was only picking on them as an example. You see, let me tell you about a pal of mine. His intercom gear made all the difference between himself and his crew, coming out of action or going under. What about Oh, the... shut up, Freddy, for once. I'll tell you what happened. Now, this tank crew were out on patrol in the desert, and they got into a scrap with the eye tires. The front gunner of the tank got wounded, and the turret took a smack that put both the intercom and the wireless out of action. They soon shook off the eye tires, 
but they had no idea where they were. They'd lost contact with the troop. It was night. Their petrol was getting short. So they backed the tank into a nearby cave in the rocks and they decided to stay there for the night. There were five of them in her crew. Came from all over the place. There was my pal, Sergeant Bill Smith, crew commander. Bluey, the gunner, an Australian. Ricky, the driver, from Trinidad. George, from Battersea, their front gunner. And Harry, their South African wireless op. Hey, Bill. This intercom's fair done for, you know. I'll have a last go on long range, see if I can get hold of anybody. Hello. Able one. Able two calling. Report my signals. Hello. Able one. Able two calling. Report my signals. Over. How you doing? No go, Sarge. Long range's dish too. All right, get her unloaded then. How is she, Rick? No good. She's on airlock drop of fuel. We'll have to push her then. Looks like they'll have to win this war without us. What a life, eh, Tiger? Lost, out of gas, stone motherless, broken, far from home. That'll be our boys now. I'll run up to the top of the wadi and give them the office. Just a minute. Might be the eye ties. I'll go. Harry. Ah, uh, binoculars. There's lorries there. Both sides of us. I don't know whose, though. That'll look too clever to me. We'll have to have a scout round and see how we're fixed. I'll go, Sarge. I'm used to the sand. I was reared in this stuff. Blue. you like quiet and you'll be all right. <laughs>
come sta? Sta bene, sta bene, ma solo fame. Hi, Ties. There's a million of them. Where are they? Now, look. Here's us, and they're round us in a flaming horseshoe. Their lorries are about a quarter of a mile away, and they seem to have a guard every few yards. Just here, there's some sort of oasis. I seen a hut. Beyond that is the salt marshes, and then the sea. What's going on? The eye tires are moving a lot of stuff around up there. Looks like they're cooking something up. How do we get out of this mess? That's got me tricked. How's George? Pretty well, Blue. He's plenty feverish. Oh, you'll be all right, Dig. I'll bet in the morning you'll be frisking around like king of the ring, the horse that's never been ridden yet. Well, comrades and friends, what do we do next? Anybody any ideas? Mm -hmm. Well, here's how I see it. It's impossible to move out until we get some more information. On the other hand, we can't stay here. Blue here says they're getting a lot of stuff together. That may mean they're planning an early attack on the rest of our gang. Well, that'll give us our big chance. As soon as they move out to attack, we'll take a crack at them. With a bit of luck, we can nip clean through them before they know what it's all about. Provided we know when they're moving out. That's what we've got to find out. Well, Sarge, I don't want to check your boyish enthusiasm, but seeing how we're fixed, making a bust through like that sounds a tricky business to me. Yes. But what do we use for petrol? And what do we use for wireless? One thing at a time. First, how do you get that intercom fixed? It's not so easy as all that, Sarge. It's your job to get it fixed. <laughs> It'll be broad daylight, remember? What the handbooks call a delicate operation. <laughs> but no kidding. If Ricky and Bluey can't hear the orders I give, it's going to be twice as difficult. All right, Sarge, I'll fix it. But how about the petrol? You leave that to me. Well, we can't do anything till morning, can we? No, you'd better get some sleep. But we've got to stay quiet. No light showing and no noise. Remember, the eye ties are likely to be on the prowl. Listen. There you go, four months there. Four. What do we got here? A newspaper. Carrera Della Serra. Well, strike me lucky. I haven't seen a newspaper since Fanny was a girl's name. Here's me breaking me neck to know what won the Melbourne Cup, and all of a sudden I get this. It's got a lovely big picture of Mussolini in it. What more do you want? Yeah, Masso. I heard him on the wireless once. He was barking like a dog. I couldn't understand a word he said. Well, I expect he was talking Italian. I don't care what he was talking. He was barking like a dog. <laughs> Come on, fellas. We better get turned in. I'm going to get cracking early in the morning. Ricky, you take first guard. You got everything? Yes.
I'll take this. Fermo, fermo, che cosa fai? How are you feeling, George, old pal? Feeling? I'll be all right. That's the stuff. Come on, I want to give you a drink. Well, where did you come from, baby dear? Do you speak English? Don't you hear what the gentleman said? He said, do you speak English? Well... Yes, yes. Sure, I speak English. All right, tell us all you know. My name is Rossi Luigi. I'm a truck driver. 26 Light Armored Regiment. Porcupine Regiment. They call us Porcospino. <laughs> Giovanni, vieni qui. Questa scatola è di sopra. Michele, vieni qui. Sta fame? Ha mangiato tardi, eh? Una presso l'altra, eh? Ah, presto, presto. Non voglio stare qui tutta la giornata. Well, looks as if the eye ties move up about seven. Oh, right. They move up about seven. And what do we do? I've got an idea about that. You get some tea ready and share out the bully. We'll save the chocolate for an emergency. I no like. You no like. Now shut up and get some tea ready. I still don't like. Boom. Hear them? What? High tide transport. They're on the move, all right. Looks like an early morning start for us. Look, Sarge, I hate to bring this up again, but what do we use for petrol? Petrol? Well, from what our gabby little friend tells us, there's a ton of petrol lying loose out there. Yeah, but how are we going to get our hooks onto some of it? I'll show you. Get your things off. Things? Clothes, clothes. Come on, come on, get him off. Bill. It's me. 
What's the idea of the fancy dress? Going out to get some petrol. We stand a better chance if I go like this. They'll do you in if they catch you in that rig out. Well, then they mustn't catch me. That's lousy with eye ties out there. Just you keep your eyes open. Blue's in charge while I'm away. Report anything you see to him. Well, hadn't you better wait a minute? The damn desert's lit up like a stadium. I've waited long enough. If I wait any longer, it'll be too late. So long. So long, Sarge. George, Georgie, you got any snouts? Sorry, I'm out. Snouts? Cigarettes to you. Got any? Yes, sure I got. Cigarette? Keep them. What you got there? Picture of your sweetie? Not my sweetie. It is my little Marco. He's four years old, like a little bull calf, eh? Wouldn't know he was a mine. He's a dead ringer for you. Got any more? This is a my home. Looks all right. Seen country like that back home in South Africa. This is Margarita, my eldest daughter. My, my, some Sheila. Look, Georgie. Got lovely big eyes, hasn't she? Hmm. That's a nice big picture of Mussolini on the wall, too. What do you think of Mussolini? Mussolini? He's a great leader. You a fascist? Of course. Much of a fascist? Oh, cut the rough, boy. Yeah, look at these pictures. Put them away. Oh, come on, George. This isn't a bally political meeting. I've had some of these fascist beauties before when I was working at sea. When you're on top, they'll come crawling like a dog. But blimey, when they're on top, God help you. I've seen these black shirt boys in Genoa bashing their own people over the head. When I was on that East Africa run, I heard a little of what they did in Abyssinia when they got their flamethrowers busy. When I was running food into Valencia, these Caproni boys used to come over and bomb us night and day. They killed two of my mates. Don't talk to me about fascists. Ah, uh, well, gentleman only wants to be friendly. A gentleman only wants a punch on top of the nose.
It's not much, but it'll see us through. We'd better get off as soon as it's light. The Itars might come snooping around. Good work, Sarge. How'd you do it? Make us a cup of tea. Well, how's she coming, Dig? Mm, she's coming. I bet you, Dina, you don't get it together in time, eh? Huh? Oh, well, you know, you never know, you know. Four o'clock already. One hour more. You know, you've got to get that mess fixed in time. I will. It takes more than an armor-piercing bullet to mug up these for long. These things are tough, you know. Uh, seems sort of crazy, don't it? Blokes working like stink all over the world to put together a flame and tangle like that. Ah, but it's me for the farm when I get back. Yeah, I'm gonna grow wheat in the cocky country. Gee, that's real country. They cut down a lot of trees once and set them across the cocky country for telegraph poles. But they took root and started to sprout leaves. So they grubbed them up and stuck them in the ground again, head down and roots in the air. And you know what? <laughs> Those flaming trees took root and sprouted leaves all over again. Fair dinkum. Ah, uh, that's real country. Grow anything. Country. You don't know what good country is. You should see Trinidad. Port of Spain. Arima. Fifth Harbor. Port of Spain, eh? When I worked on the tankers, we used to run in and out of Trinidad carrying oil to Liverpool. I'm glad I ain't on tankers now. I'm no hero. You'll have to get a move on, Harry. We haven't got much time. All right, Sarge, all right. I'm like a jackrabbit. Buddy, let's see how she goes. Can you hear me, Gunner? <laughs> Too right I can. Can you hear me, driver? Boy, I can hear you as if you are only two feet away. How are you feeling, hero? Okay. Hop up and get in, then. Everybody set? Yeah. That's them, all right. Time to move off. 
Well, you'll have to do your stuff this time, Tiger, my girl. What do we do with that bloke? Don't think we can carry him. Pull up on top here. We'd better turn him loose. Yeah, let him go. Well, you see how it is, boy. We'd love to take you with us, but the conductor says the bus is full. Never mind. There'll be plenty more along in a minute. We're off. Come on, let's go. This one with the best wishes from good old London town. One from Jobo Bluey. And Conbury. And Birmingham. And Plymouth. Give him one for my missus and kids.
Yeah, bye.